Ake ino i tātou. Ai te ari ke te atua ka haraua ko koe te ihi te wehi te tapu ko koe te mā tāpuno o ngā mia tapu katoa. Nei rā mā tō puno ngā noho mai nei te waru aro he whaka moe me te he whaka whetai. A kia uhi a mai e koe, a te tō mai rangi atawhai ki runga ki tēnā ki tēnā o mā tau i tēnei wā. Mā tau e noho nei, e noho haumaru nei ki o mā tau wake kāinga. Mā tau e awhi awhi, mā tau i a mā tau. Nō rira homai anō tō ringa tawhai, tō ringa a kaha ki a mātou ki a puta tātou a mātou i te whai ao ki te ao mārama. Hoa tu anō tō ringa tawhai ki e rā o ngā whānau e mā wiwi ana ko pāngia e te uru tā karauna te kaumā iwa ki ao te aroa nei tā tūrā ki te motu ki te ao whānui. Nō reira e te ariki whakarunga mai ki tēnei ino e tino aroha ki a koe, tūturu whakamaua ki a tīna, tīna, haumie, huie, tāikie. Ai a koe rangatira e ngā mā tāwaka o te motu, e ngā kārangatanga maha puta noi te ao, a nau mai haere mai ki tēnei huihuinga, ki tēnei kōrero, ki tēnei wānanga tahi o tātou. Nō mātou anō te honore, ka whai wāhi, ka whai wā anō koutou, i te whakarongo me te kōrero tahi ki ngā kaupapa kai mua i te arawaro. Nō reira e te tī i te tā tēnā koutou, no mai, haere mai, whakatau mai rā. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening from wherever, whichever part of the world you're from, to this webinar. Um, Anti-Racism 2020. Um, ko who am I? Um, taku pāpā nō Ngāpohi, uh, taku māma nō Waikato, taku karani pāpā nō Haina. Uh, so my father comes from the tribal areas of Ngāpohi. My mother comes from the tribal areas of Waikato, south of the Bombay. And my grandfather, who is my mother's father, uh, is ch uh, full Chinese, Wong Kao Foy, uh, from the Sunwi province. Uh, so to all my whanaunga, all my relations from those areas, and certainly um, across the world, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, ko Valence Smith tōku ingoa. My name is Valence Smith, taking you um, as chair uh, for this session. Um, just to remind everyone that we are at the right session. Today's session is Body and Blood of Indigenous Nations USA, 1492 to 2020. Arts, anti-racism, and African Americans. How do we find a way out of no way. Uh, nō reira uh, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, ko tā tātou kai kaufau, uh, ko tā tātou manuhiri kōrero, uh, kai kaue kōrero, uh, ko Professor Derek Griffith. So I'd like to introduce our um, esteemed presenter all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we had a little chinwag earlier on about... Um, uh, hot chicken earlier on, and where's the best place to go to? Because I love that stuff. But why? No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about uh, what's in front of us. So um, I would like to introduce everybody to uh, Professor Derek Griffith. Norera eko te ma homai te paki paki kiaia. Over to you, De Professor Derek. Okay. Thank you, Valence, uh, and pleasure to be with you all um, virtually. Um, it's Friday night here, so I guess it's Saturday afternoon there, um, but I have a pleasure to, to be with you. Um, I also want to uh, make sure I say uh, kia ora to um, my good mates and friends, um, Heather came prior, Dennis came prior, uh, Fryer came, um, and all of my good folks in STIR and so forth. It's, it's always such a joy to, to be with you again. Um, so what I'm going to do... Uh, Today, we want to uh, start out by, uh, so I'm going to do a brief um, presentation or at least um, some, some things to sort of stimulate some of the conversation and get us sort of in the frame of mind of thinking about some of these issues. And then I think Relance is going to um, basically, you know, help come up with questions or just we'll have some conversation. But um, I'll try to keep the presentation brief. I kind of got excited with certain parts of it, so I'll try to, you know, whiz through that pretty quickly. But um, 
I do want to introduce some ideas and to give you a foundation for the conversation that we'll have over the next hour. So, cool. If I could just um, jump in there right now, Derek, um, just to um, let everyone know that um, this is a, uh, a fireside chat. And so as Derek has said, he's going to introduce a few ideas. And then what we do, uh, are doing is we're welcoming uh, questions. Um, you can uh, type in questions in the Q&A box, of course, um, with the chat box as well. They'll be generating some discussion there. So if your questions are also um, in the chat box, then we have our moderator. Thank you, Stephen Blythe, who is going to yes. take those questions from the chat box, put them in the Q&A, um, and then we'll just try and generate some kind of discussion. Kia ora tātou. Okay. So if I can do this. This uh, one first. Okay. So share. Okay. So I want to start, um, let me begin by just acknowledging um, my team here at Vanderbilt. Um, I can't, usually I mentioned that they're um, busy working, but it's evening here. So hopefully they're actually finally getting a bit of a break and um, enjoying their weekends. But I do want to acknowledge them. Um, my Fanu, uh, my family, um, this is my nephew, sister, and parents, um, they are from different parts of the Caribbean. Um, my mom is from Jamaica and her family is from Jamaica. My father's from Guyana in South America. And um, my sibling, my sister and my uh, nephews uh, were all born in the States. So um, definitely have um, that, all of that experience as well. But um, they are certainly very important to me as a foundation. And I know uh, family is so important to you in New Zealand as well. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, about a year ago, um, one of the inspirations for the book that we just published um, last year, late last year, uh, Racism, Science and Tools for the Public Health, or pu health, public health Professional, um, both an inspiration for the book as well as um, a contributor to the book, um, Dr. Bill Jenkins, who was one of the folks who was behind the scenes, um, very involved in um, calling an end to what many people know as the Tuskegee syphilis study, um, the US Public Health Service study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male, or however you want to sort of refer to it. But he was on the inside of, of CDC, um, or the Public Health Service is part of that. And so it's important to sort of acknowledge him, um, in, both in his passing, but also in his role. And part of what I want to talk about is um, some of the challenges of being in different places and some of how do you come up with and stay inspired, stay motivated to do the work that we have to do um, in a context where you may not see a lot of hope and you may really get frustrated. Um, so what I decided to do in the presentation is turn to the arts. Um, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't uh, make art of any kind. Um, but I definitely have an appreciation for it. And um, I think arts can be really critical in helping to inspire the way that we think about new ideas, <clears throat> see the same things in different light and see the thing same things in different ways. And so I, part of the presentation is really to stimulate this conversation and to help us think through these kinds of ideas. So I'm gonna walk through um, a couple things as just foundation and then um, open it up. So the real question for me is, um, and this came out of you know, conversations over the years with, um, again, my, my bud and partner in crime, uh, Heather Kane Fryer. Uh, for, yeah, um, you know, how do we, and can we actually do things like eliminate racism? Or you know, um, there are certainly those who come from a particular camp, particularly in the United States, that don't think racism will ever be eliminated, it's something that we just have to manage. Um, and so, you know, I know she and I've had lots of interesting conversations about, is it possible to do that? And how do you even come up with an idea of what that really would look like? It seems so audacious to think that you're gonna come up with a strategy to eliminate this thing that has basically permeated all of our lives and 
that of many generations of our families, and yet we're going to come up with a strategy that's going to rid the, rid our world of this, is a really is a really crazy idea in some way. But it's it's one that you can also see um, how how inspiring that is. But you have to kind of be a bit you have to think about the world a bit differently to even consider that that's a possibility. I do want to sort of note. Um, you know, this idea of being an activist, and there's lots of contention about sort of what that really means. But I do want to get to the idea that this is certainly um, one of the lessons I think certainly from Stir, and that I think is a great example, is that you're really working with other people. I don't, you know, argu arguably, I wouldn't consider you an activist if you're sort of doing things just on your own. I do think activism is basically something you have to do in concert with others where you sort of develop a shared vision and you're having to work with others in a particular time and space. And that you're doing that um, not just to get away from something or to address a bad thing, but you usually have to have some kind of positive vision of what you're trying to achieve. You can't just always look to try to fix the, the problem, but you have to have some inspiration for where you're actually going. And so I think both of these, both sides of these are where we're hoping this conversation is gonna take us. So the way that I structured this very briefly is um, in, the, in a paper that uh, Heather and I wrote a few years ago, we used a model that um, I, we borrowed from a scholar here in the States, um, Naeem Akbar, who had a framework for thinking about, um, the book was called Know Thyself. And he had this process, used fancier words than I'm going to, but it was basically how do you facilitate unlearning, coming up with new strategies, and then devising new ways of thinking. And so I'm going to walk through a couple of examples from the arts that may stimulate such a thing before I sort of open it up. So the first is um, a rather famous quote from the book um, Invisible Man. And part of the, part of the point of this particular um, quote and why I really love this quote and use it um, way too much probably, but it says, I'm an invisible man. I'm invisible understand simply because people refuse to see me. And I want to stop there because it's important to understand, you know, part of what you're trying to do in the work of racism is help people to see those and see experiences and see ways of approaching the world in ways that they uh, and, and to walk in the shoes of someone that they may not have otherwise. And so part of what this is pointing to, even as old as it is, 70 years old, essentially, um, he was pointing to the idea that basically people, some of the choices that people are making are just their simply desire, their willingness, they're not willing to actually try to see somebody differently, try to see somebody for who they are, for their real hu humanity, they're actually just refusing to see them in their fullness of, as, of, a, of a person. And they're really struggling to do that. And so sometimes you will have people sort of um, impose particular views and things on you. And how do you help them sort of walk through that? Or how do, how do you sort of work through those kinds of issues? Um, there are a couple of movies. Um, I watch way too much TV in my free time. Um, and um, one of the movies that I like from the 70s is called Watermelon Man. And it's the idea, and then the premise of the movie is um, a rather bigoted uh, middle-class uh, white man who has a family um, in, I believe it's the, in, I don't remember what part of the United States it is, but um, he makes all these constant sort of jokes and, and those kinds of things in his sort of daily life. And then all of a sudden he wakes up black and they don't know why they can't explain it. They have no sense of how to deal with it. Um, but everything about him changes. Um, and it's basically this whole, you know, um, figuring out of how is he supposed to live in this new world and live in, live in this new body and live in this new life. And how does he make sense of that? And he really struggled to do, he fought it just at first. But then he at some point decided, okay, well, this is my life now, so I'm going to have to figure out how to do it. But then he lost a lot in that whole relationship. He lost the relationship with his wife. I don't want to ruin the whole movie, but he had kids and a job and so forth. And there were lots of challenges that he didn't realize had something to do with the color of his skin, the hair, the texture of his hair, and just the body that he was living in and how that influenced what he was doing. 
there's a newer sort of documentary that talks about um, skin color and it's called Dark Girls. And there's a lot in um, of, you could say intraracial or internalized racism um, that we talk about a lot in communities of African descent um, where we think about um, essentially colorism. So um, in certain past generations, there was a lot of attention to folks being darker skinned or that connected more to um, your Africanness was seen as a negative, was seen as something that was bad and, and problematic versus being lighter skinned or, or looking more both in terms of characteristics and features as well as skin color and so forth. But how these kind of things get embodied into um, not just experiences with whites, but how they also get embodied in experiences with people of their own particular racial group. And so you have this other tension of how those kind of things get embodied that this um, represents. Um, I just love this piece because it sort of, you know, gets, this is um, a, a painting actually um, that I just think is absolutely amazing that highlights this relationship between, you know, um, George Washington and I believe this is George Washington, um, or it could be Thomas Jefferson, actually. It's more likely Thomas Jefferson, given his relationship um, with, um, with Black women and so forth. But anyway, one of these founders of the United States um, and this idea that they were trying to do these things and we have these values that our country is based on, yet behind that there was this tension and this um, problem that we had as a, as a country that they were only really creating these laws, creating these, these things that they were trying to do that were really only supposed to reach a certain population. Just as a quick example, again, I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but I do want to sort of give a couple other stimulating sort of ideas. So that was sort of to help unlearn some of the things. Those were examples of ways to, or things that you could use to stimulate conversations about ways to think differently or to get in the experience or to try to at least explore what it means to walk in somebody else's shoes to better understand how to deal with those kinds of issues. The next is how do you come up with this, these audacious, crazy ideas of new ways of thinking about the kinds of things that you're facing? And starting with what you're trying not to think about, which is some of the more explicit overt forms of racism. Um, unfortunately, um, I live in, well not unfortunately, I live in the South, but um, there, the Ku Klux Klan has certainly been an epitome of a lot of racist images and so forth and perpetuating those kinds of things. There have been some artists recently who've basically tried to um, take those things that we, that have had so much power, some of those figures, some of those images and, and symbols that had so much power and basically take their power back or take their power away. So this is an artist um, I think his name is Ryan, um, I forgot his last name that quickly. Um, but basically he made them into, I mean, you see such a range of different um, um, garments and different images that he used and different patterns and so forth that he used to basically take the power away from that, even used some um, West African um, garments and so forth. So you see the kente cloth ones that are here in the, the, the gold and yellow and those um, sort of cubic patterns is a, a West African pattern. There's also another artist um, who basically take, took those and wanted to stimulate people to think differently about well, what, is this, what does this mean for people to have this experience and to think about these things in the US context. So she created these pieces and how this really affects and, and relates to sort of the experience of pe certain people in the United States that these things may seem synonymous the white supremacist sort of notions and ways of living and how that may feel synonymous with some of the um, particularly nationalist values that some people may have. One of my favorite, um, um, and you notice that I'm, what I'm trying to also do is stick mostly to fiction and things that are sort of really outside of the box of things rather than just giving you sort of documentaries and things that are sort of going to deepen just your, your, your serious sort of knowledge. But I'm just giving examples of things that are more fiction that really extend creatively how we think about these issues. Um, last couple of examples, um, a book called Faces at the Bottom of the Well is one of my favorites by an author named Derek Bell, who's a lawyer, who basically 
what the what was he was one of the, also the founders of critical race theory and so forth. Um, he would basically take legal precedent and sort of play out. Um, if you were to take this out into, you know, an extreme, what would this actually look like? And so he had different um, short stories and so forth, and even full length books. Um, one of them uh, that was made into a brief movie in the, I believe it was the 80s, um, called Space Traders was basically the idea that would the world sell, um, particularly African Americans, for if aliens came down and basically said, we're going to give you um, the keys to good health, to the basically an unlimited set of resources and power, um, you know, things that would make everybody else healthy, but we're going to take all the African Americans. And the question essentially he was asking is, would that be too high of a price for the world to, to do? Is They don't know what they're going to do with them. They wouldn't tell them what they would do with these um, African Americans, but they would just take them and they wanted to take them and wherever they were from and um, in their particular alien lands, but they wanted to just take them and would we be willing as a, as a world to trade a particular population for these kinds of things? Um, without getting too political, but in the midst of this coronavirus stuff, we're actually seeing not quite that extreme of a example or comparison, but we are seeing a lot of tension, certainly in the States, of people fighting this idea that um, there's, there's a tension between the economic health of the country and whether or not the public health of the country is worth sacrificing, you know, are, and people are sort of saying, or certain politicians are saying, you know, they're much, they're willing to basically put themselves and their, you know, their loved ones and everybody else at risk of their health for trying to basically maintain the economy and the re return the economic health of the country so that we don't go into a recession. So there's these weird tensions that, again, you wouldn't think this would really apply, but in my mind, this really does. The last couple of examples I want to give, um, well, Harriet's not, let me, sorry, I just wanted to highlight one quick thing. The last one I'll do, um, again, this took longer than I was hoping, but I think it's still been a useful foundation, is a book called, it was a book and then a movie called The Spook Who Sat by the Door. And basically, it's a book that was written in about 1970, by an author named Sam Greenlee, and then it was made into sort of a B, low budget movie, but um, it's, it is accessible. But it basically plays out this idea of he was the first black um, FBI agent, and he takes those um, lessons that he learned as an FBI agent and basically trains um, gangs in the Chicago area and, and black gangs basically across the United States to, to start a revolution, an armed revolution. And part of the importance of the book is not that he's actually proposing an armed revolution, because he's not really, he's playing out what would it look like to take these kinds of ideas, what would it take to think through how do we come up with something better than this extreme solution that would be harmful to lots of people? But how do you think through what are these, these things that we're trying to play out to better understand what are some solutions that we actually think would be valuable and useful? So let me close with this. Um, another person that I don't think people give enough credit to as sort of a, um, I'll call revolutionary, but certainly a poet, um, would be Tupac. And I just want to leave you with this, this um, poem that he has in, that called um, In the Event of My Demise. In the event of my demise, when my heart can beat no more, I hope I die for a principle or a belief that I'd live for. I will die before my time because I feel the shadow's depths, so much I wanted to accomplish before I reach my death. I've come to grips with the possibility and wiped the last tears from my eyes. I loved all those who are positive in the event of my demise. So let me stop there. Thank you. And I see we got a lot of questions. <laughs> Te Nākui. Te Nākui, Derek, Ianā Kōrero. Thank you for that, um, for those, um, for introducing some of those those themes. Um, so Fana, we're going to be taking any questions. We're just waiting in the in the Q and A box now. 
Um, but just to um, get things moving, um, yesterday, Derek, um, I attended a webinar, a webinar um, about cultural safety. Um, and they talked about um, the invisibility of Indigenous peoples um, of Australia in policy and legislation. Um, I think over a whole suite of different legislations, I think only twice uh, were Indigenous peoples um, mentioned. And as such, those policies and legislations being culturally um, unresponsive uh, mm -hmm. to the needs of the Indigenous peoples. Um, in your research or certainly your personal life, have you encountered any of this um, within your own personal research regarding the intersection of art um, and visibility theme um, in particular? Yeah, I mean, I, I won't, I mean, not so much with the art, because that's just sort of things that I found to stimulate new ways of thinking, but definitely in my life, and even um, actually, again, um, since we're in sort of coronavirus land right now, a concrete example that I will give you is um, we know that the patterns of who's, get, who's um, contracting the virus and who's dying of the virus is actually highly gendered. So we're, we're seeing men in, I believe it was in Italy, 80% of the deaths were men. Um, in every country where we've seen a sort of um, significant um, number of cases, men have sort of contracted at higher rates and died at higher rates. In the United States, even though the guidance from WHO has been consistently since 2007 to um, disaggregate things by gender, they have decided not to, or we have, we have not in the United States, I'm not gonna make it, um, make it an explicit decision, but it's not been something that we've decided to do in the United States. And so it's doing exactly what you're describing is basically you have a problem that you don't, you're not gonna be able to adequately address because you're not looking at how it differentially affects certain populations and groups. So we've definitely seen that with race. We do that a lot in the United States with race. We've certainly seen that with, um, you know, things, policies that were supposed to helpfully, um, hopefully try to um, equate opportunities for educational opportunities, jobs, and so forth, that we didn't collect the data or didn't really look at how is this differentially affecting or is it reaching all the populations that it needs to reach. So it definitely that kind of um, it, somehow just invisibility and, and I think um, Kimberly Crenshaw has actually called it intersectional invisibility because a lot of times we don't look at the intersection of gender and race or indigenous status and so forth as it relates to that. So um, I think both of those are really important. Kia ora. Um, I've got a question here and you'll have to forgive me, Anne, um, if I don't pronounce your uh, last name uh, correctly. And I think it's really important that we do honour people's names. Um, so um, in advance, um, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. So this is a question from Anne Lemieux. Um, the foundation of the United States is built on the settler experience and the concept of manifest destiny. The second amendment, amendment right to bear arms was predicated on the racist notion of Native Americans being the savage other this concept of savage other being extended to African-Americans. White supremacy maintains its cultural mythology through continued stereotyping of Native Americans and others. The question is, how do we address racism in the US in light of these deeply rooted beliefs? That's a million, billion, trillion dollar question and a wonderful one. And I think, um, you know, I think that's why we're having this conversation is because, you know, clearly as long as there have been this acknowledgement that people are treated differently and that um, you have these deeply rooted um, struggles and things that are so baked into the, the fabric of our society um, that we have to come up with new strategies of dealing with that. If we, if we could use the strategies that we already had, we would have fixed these problems already. So part of what we're trying to think through is how do we do that? I think one of the one of the pieces that I was trying that I'm um, in the process of thinking through and trying to write right now is there typically have been um, different um, strategic visions for how we're supposed to achieve um, social change. So part of the the where this originally sort of came from was uh, Manning Marable had written um, a book some years ago as a historian that passed on some years ago 
but he, he had these sort of three sort of camps of um, when he was sort of stepping back and looking at how is social change, what have, what have activists tried to do in the United States? And so he kind of put them into three big groups. And basically where I'm going is that I think we need to not sort of limit ourselves to any particular strategy. Part of what I was showing in, or didn't actually keep you know showing you was that we need people to fill all different roles. So one was basically essentially that you need to strengthen the networks and the resources within a particular group and population. So whether it's within Native Americans, whether it's within uh, Black populations, that you need to create something that helps to support that population and build them up from the inside. You also need strategies that are going to help um, take people who um, may be marginalized in a particular setting, but help to call out and, and address those settings that we're actually going to keep that we think have some merit and some utility in our society, but that we really need to figure out how to fix. So there are things that we're trying to adapt, adopt, modify these particular systems and structures. There are certain systems and structures that we also think are, are so fundamentally flawed that we basically need to sort of scrap them and start all over again. And so we need to come up with ways to, again, come up with creative strategies to do that. We've typically, people who've, who've, uh, who've approached social change from each of those perspectives have usually not necessarily worked together and approach these things together. And what I'm suggesting um, in, in response to Anne's question is basically that we need to come up with a strategy that is essentially three-pronged, at minimum three-pronged, that you actually try to address all of those different parts because it's not really an either or proposition. It really is that we need all of those and probably more. I'm just going through some of these questions here. Yeah, we got them flowing. I see. <laughs> I see them popping up. There's a lot of there's a lot of conversation being generated there, Derek. Yes, great, great. And so, and thank you for what a for a wonderful question. Um, you're talking about strategies um, and what different strategies are there. So I'm just trying to um, link now back to um, the arts um, and in terms of um, you were mentioning different movies and so on and. Um, I reflect on, you know, a few of Spike Lee's movies mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, one of the latest movies, not, well, not latest, but the movie Get Out, which really mm -hmm. addressed um, racism. Um, so do you have any strategies within the arts themselves? You can use movies or music or anything like that that might address some of these deep-seated beliefs? Yeah, I think it's, it's I guess, my my idea and point of all of this is to use whatever works for you. I mean, I think people are drawn to different um, different strategies or different things that resonate with them. And if you're going to reach people, um, so let me say this a different way. I think one of the problems that we've had in the way that we've approached some anti-racism work is we've tried to go through the head to the heart. And what I'm actually saying with the arts is we probably need to try to approach the heart first, and then that will influence the head. So whatever is going to really resonate with the people that helps them really understand at a much deeper level what in the world they're actually dealing with or what others are struggling with when they talk about experiencing things like racism or when you're saying that somebody is benefiting from a racist system, that you need whatever tool that, that, that will help them understand that if it's music, if it's a particular painting, if it's art, if it's some kind of dance, if it's whatever, the movie, you know, but it's like, it, it can have some things that you try to utilize to um, figure out what for that particular individual or that particular group of individuals, what's gonna help them have that, stimulate that conversation so that they can then have um, that ability to connect with somebody else and then build that relationship to then be able to understand you know, what they're experiencing and what those other, what both sides are experiencing in this particular phenomenon. Kia ora, thank you, thank you. Um, I think that's, you know, the, from the heart to the head, I think you definitely lead or aim from the heart, um, which is something that I definitely agree with. You know, I remember one of the slides that you had on earlier, I can't remember exactly what I said, but it, I mentioned um, several different indicators, economic, um, social and cultural. So I, I suppose, um, the cultural change um, m might be um, 
something that really resonates or connects to the heart because with a cultural shift, then other things will fall into place. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really been, been challenging, you know, if you, so one of the things that, that I've had, I've learned in just doing this work that's been particularly humbling is how to, and why I'm such a fan of history is, you know, I thought I was thinking earlier about, um, again, how crazy I thought, you know, I've had lots of conversations over the years about, you know, had I been born, you know, 20 years earlier, what would I have been doing in the civil rights movement, for example? And where would I have fallen? Would I have been sort of a Martin Luther King and followed that camp? Or would I have been more of Malcolm X? Or would I have been, you know, a Black Panther, whatever? And um, I was thinking earlier about how what, it, what, what did it have to, what, what did you really have to believe if you were a follower of um, Martin Luther King to basically say, okay, I'm going to believe so deeply in this particular approach that I'm going to put my physical self at risk and I'm going to love my enemy strongly enough that I'm going to believe that putting myself, putting the people that I care about the most in harm's way to try to change how you believe your, your heart and that's going to do something good for the overall country. I mean, just to literally put yourself physically in harm's way on a regular basis, and that's going to be the thing that you think is going to really change the world. That is just, I, I, I was struggling with that earlier as I was sort of thinking about this and preparing for it. I was like, I don't know that I have that. And how do you come up with these kinds of ideas that make absolutely, I mean, frankly, it makes no sense. You're going to literally put yourself and your loved ones at, at, in harm's way for this idea that you hope somebody's going to, their heart is going to change to do that. That's really difficult, but you, it tells you the depth of belief and true courage, as somebody's saying in the, in the chat. That's what I'm talking about. How do you stimulate that? And once you get it, how do you actually continue that after, you know, because that's been the other problem. It's the problem we run into with health behavior as much as we do with any other kind of behavior. It's not just changing it, but how do you sustain that, you know, over time? Because you're going to get tired, you're going to get discouraged, you're going to experience things, but how do you actually maintain that? And some of that is going back to what's the thing that I'm trying to do? And so you need that kind of constant reminder. You need those kind of connections that are going to help you do that. And I believe the arts can be a key part of that. Kilda. Um, a question from Don Mann. I wonder if it's the same Don man I know. Hey, Don. Um, the Oscar's <laughs> so white. He goes, the Oscar's so white. This course has mostly been binary, black versus white. How do First Nations artists and Hispanic artists find a voice in that space? I think it's, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and I wish I had a good answer. I mean, I think... Um, we haven't done well even just with the binary, so I can only imagine, you know, for groups that don't even fit that binary and don't get acknowledged in those spaces, how difficult that must be. I mean, I think, honestly, some of it is, I think part of it's the big picture of what do you, being, being recognized by the Oscars is certainly a big, you know, accomplishment, but is that really the goal? Or is it really to do things, you may decide that yes, if that happens, that that's really nice, but you may actually decide to create a separate way of acknowledging people who are doing great work. And that if you do that great work, then maybe that's how it's gonna to have to get acknowledged. But I don't know that necessarily going through that um, and doing work that's gonna to try to meet that standard or speak to that audience in a way that they're gonna recognize its greatness is always gonna be the marker of success. I think you have to be comfortable. That's kind of what I was talking about with these different three different streams of, of thinking that sometimes you just have to be comfortable with you know, yourself and with your particular group acknowledging and loving you and saying, you know, this is, this is great work. So if I go and, and I meet with my Maori colleagues from STIR and so forth and they come up with something and they really love it and you know, then that should be good enough. I mean, I don't, you know, if, if the Oscars never acknowledge it or if the larger society in, um, you know, New Zealand don't acknowledge it, I mean, does that make it any less valuable? I would say no. 
So I think it's, it's understanding what are the goals of what you're trying to do and how important is that to you? Because, yeah, you can do things, but it sometimes means that it takes you off the path of what you're really trying to do. While we're here, what do you think of the Oscars? I don't watch them. I'm not a fan. <laughs> so it doesn't mean much to me because most of the movies are not things that I've ever seen. So it's just kind of like I don't, I don't really, yeah. I'd rather just find things that I think speak to me. Cool. Um, well, just segueing into that, or from that, into this next question from Diane. Can you speak on Ava, Ava DuVernay? DuVernay. Yeah, DuVernay, mm -hmm. regarding the mm -hmm. Netflix series When They See Us and how she used her art in film to have a profound effect on those who abuse their power. Yeah, Ava, Ava DuVernay is, is um, I won't to try to speak to that one in particular, just because it would probably take too long, but she um, is just absolutely amazing and just is a perfect example of the embodiment of exactly what I'm talking about. She's done another thing called 13, which was about the 13th Amendment, as well as the idea of mass incarceration and how that is what are the roots of that within sort of an economic and political system in the United States and how those things are connected, but how she's using her art to bring narratives and bring stories and bring to light what really happened behind these different things is part of what I'm actually saying is really necessary. But it's also, I mean, I think that that's a key part of sort of what she does and what she brings to the table that makes her such an important part of these larger conversations. So she brings to light the truth about things that have otherwise been obscured. What I'm also saying is that's useful and that's helpful, but it doesn't necessarily help us figure out, okay, so what do we do with that? And yeah, we do need to know the truth and we do need those kinds of things, but there's also the step of, okay, so what do, how do, well, now that we know the truth, how do we take these things the next step to do something to undo or prevent this from happening in the future? And so some of those lessons can come from um, those, you know, presenting the truth and presenting an alternative picture and a more full and holistic picture of those kind of stories. But it also does mean thinking about, okay, so we know these kind of things happen. We know they're horrible. Um, we're not surprised by them. You kind of know it before you even see the story that how bad it's going to be. Or you may not know exactly how bad it's going to be, but you know it's going to be pretty horrible. And so the question is, okay, so what do we do with that? Kia um, Thank you for that answer, um, Professor Derek. Uh, another question from Pippa uh, Salonius. Um, acknowledging that we need a sense of community, and indeed, we need to encourage a sense of community to then bring about social change and positive growth and inclusion. Yet, it has been said that where there is a we, there will always be a marginalised other, i.e. those who are not part of the we. How can we all develop this inclusion, develop this inclusive sense of community, and at the same time, discourage the idea of the other? Yeah, uh, these are, these are as um, outstanding questions. I think it's starting with doing exactly what your question um, alludes to, which is basically acknowledging that typically even though we tend to be really good at bringing certain people to the table to spend the effort to really think about who's not there or to make sure that you, you look, you know, at the margins of the space where you are or to the margins of a particular population and look around and say, well, why aren't certain people there? And who's not there? Who's, and, and not just to, to look at who's potentially around that may you may be able to immediately sort of bring into the space, but to really be thoughtful about who's visibly not there, but then who's also not visibly there. I mean, there can be other identities and other things around that and perspectives that are going to be represented that may not be so physically obvious by things like skin color, hair texture, and so forth like that. So it's important to kind of bring those to be as deliberate as the question suggests in thinking about who needs to be at the table and that everybody, essentially the answer is everybody who's, who's genuinely interested needs to be at the table. But I think that's the only caveat that I would say is you want to make sure that in, in certain spaces, at least this is the Derek version of this, that in certain spaces that you have to have 
um, a safe space to deal with the work that is going to, that you have to have a safe space to, to figure out how the core group of folks who actually have a shared vision are going to work together and are going to address those things. That may be different than how you approach groups that you're trying to convince to get on board with whatever it is you're trying to do. But I think you want to support the strength that you have and build from a position of strength, and then and separately realize what you need to do to convince people who are not on board with your particular way of thinking and approaching the world. Kia ora, ben akwe. Um, we have an anonymous uh, question. Okay. The artist Kara Walker, or that's yes. probably Kara, Kara Walker, is quite a polarizing figure within the black and wider community. Do you think that artists make art to encourage and support the black audience? Or do you think art that shocks and unsettles the viewer to, pro to provoke thought is a better approach? I, I, again, I would, I love the question. I think I would push back on the idea that it's either or. I think some people need to be, I mean, I showed you some things that are rather uncomfortable for folks to see. And I think some people do need to be shaken up and shocked into, into those kinds of things. Um, yeah, Kara Walker does, I mean, for those who don't know her work, um, very big, I mean, like she does literally massive pieces. So she did something I think called Sugar Baby, which was literally probably a 50 foot um, statue of a sort of hybrid, um, like Aunt Jemima sort of figure and like an animal sort of figure, um, kind of a hybrid sort of Sphinx Aunt Jemima kind of looking image. But it was it was literally massive. I mean, probably 50 feet tall and, and solid white, even though it had these very, um, very distinctly African features. But I think it, it's it's not a one size fits all model. I think that's part of what I'm, what I'm at least in my head sort of coming to is depending on who you're dealing with, that we have to sort of segment the population and segment people in such a way that they can think, of, I mean, that they're going to have different needs and we're going to have different things that we need to say to them, engage with them. And we need to think about that and not sort of try to squeeze everybody into one particular box. Kia ora, Derek. Um, a question from your very good friend, Heather. Yes. Hi, Heather. Where did it go? How can the global public health community support USA colleagues on the ideological front line to stop the harm Trump is inflicting? Well, Heather, you know, I, I wish I had a good answer again. I think um, some of it is, isn't doing what we do sort of online and offline, which is basically help who are, so let me again sort of say this a slightly different way. I think there's, there are people that you realize are sort of on your same page and that you have a shared vision or shared understanding with and that you're in solidarity with because you actually have a, a similar understanding of what's going on and that you sort of buy into a particular way of understanding the world and the problem. I think you coming up with strategies, helping to identify new strategies, new ways, or to even think through, um, you know, or to brainstorm, how do we actually address this particular issue? Are there models that we, or examples that we can use from other places that we may be able to approach this particular problem or, or you know, government or this particular issue or time period with? What can we learn from other places? What can we learn from other approaches and how do we apply that to a particular setting? I think that's, again, there's that part, but then there's also, so what are, the, what are the levers that we can actually push and how do we more effectively identify when and where those things are and make sure that we're adequately prepared to deal with those kinds of things. And sometimes those levers can be better pushed by people outside of your context and country than those sort of inside. So, you know, I know, for example, one of the historical lessons from a lot of activists is they had very, they had a very difficult time convincing people who were in their particular um, families, in their home sort of areas that people should follow them. So 
you know, if you notice sort of the context, Martin Luther King didn't really do a lot in Atlanta. He did a lot in adjacent sort of areas that were in the Southeast largely, but he didn't really, you know, organize a lot too much in, in Atlanta per se. He didn't, you know, his father was such a big figure as a pastor and as a leader in that particular area. It was difficult for him to get sort of space to sort of do that. So I think that's, it's, it's approaching it with um, having those people who are not in the space to help us think through these kind of strategies. And I think that would apply to anywhere. So anywhere that you're seeing um, a struggle that to have people outside of that struggle to, to give you a different lens and a fresh perspective on it, because sometimes when you're amidst the trees, you can't see the whole forest. Mm. Kia ora, Derek. Um, we are drawing on to the, maybe the, we'll take two more questions. Um, okay. We'll see how we go though. Francis and Michael Naira. The night is from Hokianga, maybe. Tenako to Katoya Kufanonga. I don't see Motown anymore. <laughs> In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, black music talked about oppressions, opp oppression, etc., but was accepted as universal messages across the world. My people in New Zealand loved Motown as the messages resonated with the issues faced in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Question is why has Motown gone? Has Motown gone? So Motown is still there. Um, Detroit is still, you know, um, is now in the process of trying to make a comeback. I think the broader question, speaking to that um, area genre of music that sort of spoke to those things, um, part of the challenge is it potentially didn't become profitable or they didn't see it as continuing to be something that was profitable. So part of the challenge is, and that's kind of what I was speaking to with even the question about um, the, um, the Oscars, is just because it doesn't necessarily make money or doesn't necessarily um, you know, get wide acclaim doesn't necessarily make it any less valuable and important. And so I think there's a lot of music that does still speak to these kinds of issues that you don't, you know, you're not going to necessarily hear on the radio. You're not going to see in, you know, thousands of theaters across the world if it was, um, or, you know, played on all kinds of radio stations or, you know, streamed everywhere, but that are still speaking to a lot of the same issues that were spoke to, spoken to by, the, by that genre of music and by Motown. But I think it was, some of it's a lot of complications of Motown itself and how they were their financial model and all that kind of stuff. But I think there's some challenges just with, um, cause there was a, um, sorry, there was a related part of this that was a later step, which was in the nineties and late eighties and nineties, there was also a move to um, have a lot more, essentially you could say conscious um, hip hop or conscious rap music. And that was supplanted by a lot of the gang, what was then be called sort of gangster rap. So that sort of took it over. And it's a question of sort of, is it just interest or was it um, that the people who were making the music and who were responsible for marketing the music decided that wasn't what they wanted to market anymore. And so they decided to sort of shift it. So it's kind of hard to know what actually happened there, but it's, it's different forces that we need to pay attention to in that context. Kia ora. Um, another anonymous attendee, what is your opinion of the usage, usage of certain racial slurs and or racist caricatures as a form of ownership through art? Is it a positive thing? That's a tricky one for me. I mean, I think the, the slurs and the usage in just common language, I find um, a struggle. Um, I get it, but I don't really, it doesn't resonate with me. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not useful for some, but for me, it doesn't do what it's intending to do. I think the efforts to reclaim those kinds of things in certain arts, um, again, it worked for some, it may not work for others. Like for some people, the, um, the effort, the pieces that I showed you that were taking the, the, the structure of the clan robes and presenting them in these very different garment structures, patterns, and so forth, 
that will resonate very strongly with some people. Others would be like, they, that doesn't do anything for them. So I think it's, it's, you know, my particular taste and yeah, that doesn't really do much for me, but I think in different spaces and contexts, it's a very useful and effective tool because it does kind of push people's buttons or to think, force them to think very differently and see the world in a different way. Sure, Derek, um, Professor Derek, we're going to take our last uh, question now. We are um, four minutes from finishing. Um, okay. so, so we're going to be mindful of that, but um, a very important question, I think from Don uh, Lemieux here. Um, for many, but not all U.S. tribes, the goal was not one of equality and inclusiveness in U.S. society, but rather to maintain self-autonomy self -autonomy and sovereignty. How do we, we reconcile this with Martin Luther King's ideas of equality in U.S. society? Um, again, I think you... you... It all depends, you know, I, I think this is where the whole idea of dealing with racism and goes back to sort of the original question is what's the way that we're trying to make and where are we trying to get, what's the goal that we're trying to achieve, let me say it that way. Um, for some, it is dealing with um, historical oppression in a particular way and dealing with it very directly and um, they had a really unique experience in a, and um, a different um, context for experiencing things that Martin Luther King did. And so let me, so I think it kind of depends on the context of history and that particular population. Um, Martin Luther King's strategy concretely, just, I mean, another way to think about this, his strategy didn't really work terribly well in certain areas of the country. It worked and fit very well with the Southeast, where there was a certain form of racism, there was a certain structure and a certain cultural sort of values and beliefs. When he tried to take that to Midwestern cities, to the Northeast, it failed, frankly. And so I think it depends on, there has to be a matching of strategies with the setting, the population, and the goals that the people who are trying to achieve success and what that means to them needs to look like. But I don't think the goals necessarily are going to always be the same. I think there has to be some synergy, though, in recognition that people have different things that they're trying to get out of it. And can we make sure that whatever people are trying to get out of it are not hurting others while they do that? So that would be my only sort of answer. But it's a tremendous question. Tēnā koe. Um, tēnā koe te, e te ahorangi, uh, Derek Griffith. Uh, ngā mihi nui ki a koe, mi o whakaro rangatira. Uh, ko whare ki hia e koe, uh, ki mui te arawaro uh, o te marea uh, e whakarongorongo mai ana ki a koe uh, mi, o, uh, mi o whakaro hohonu uh, reto um, rangatira. Mōhio mātou. Uh, nō reta, thank you very much, um, Professor Derek Griffith, Griffith, for sharing your time with us, sharing your ideas, um, this robust conversation that we've had within this um, fireside chat. Um, thank you to everybody also who have participated in generating this discussion alongside Professor Derek, um, because without you guys, um, this will just be myself and Derek talking about um, probably other stuff. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. um, but thank you very much, uh, Professor Derek. Um, I do believe that um, your or, or this session uh, will be available. Um, online on the YouTube and on the um, uh, Facebook group website. So everybody out there in the, in the cyber world, cyberspace, if we could promote uh, the Facebook page, Decolonization, uh, Decolonizing 2020, um, and just reminding people that there are other sessions that are coming up um, that we can also find um, on the Facebook page, I believe. Um, but certainly... Um, thank you again, uh, Professor Derek. You know, one of the things that really resonated with, with, with myself was um, this whole sense of um, collectivity, um, irrespective of which, um, where you come from, who you are. Um, if we have a song, uh, a sole purpose, a strong purpose, and that binds us all together, um, then that's how we're going to get through some of, um, you know, this, some of those challenges that we're facing in 2020. Yeah. Um, when I think about our own personal 
um, position here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I think of the word called tahitanga, um, which is unity. And so irrespective of, again, um, where we come from, kotahitanga or unity transcends all our different, uh, all our differences and so on. Um, and that stems from um, getting to know each, know each other, positionality, critical reflection, who we are. And once we build those relationship, relationships, then we can we have a real, authentic and genuine uh, mana enhancing relationship? How do we empower each other's capacity to be able to build better and uh, better societies for each other? Hoia no kātira ki reira, ngā mihi nui ki a kui Derek, and also to all our support team, um, Stephen, Bridget, Jeff, um, Heather came, everyone that supported everyone in the back, all, all, all ourselves in the background. Ngā mihi nui ki a pui te katoa, i runga no i te mōhio, a mihi mea ki te pai, ki muri, ka pai, ki mua. If everything in the back is sound, everything in the front is going to be great. Nō reira, e te, i, e te iwi, ngā mihi nui ki a pui te katoa. I'm just going to close uh, with a karakia I, um, at this time. Nō reira, e te iwi, kia karakia tātou. Uh, e te ariki manaki tia mai mātou i tēnei wā, manaki tia mai mai o mātou whānau, e rai mauwewi ana, e rawa kore ana, e pani ana. Uhia mai te tō mai rangia, tapa i kei runga ki tēnā ki tēnō mātou, hei āwhena he tohu tohu i a mātou, nā ko nāno wirohia mātou ki te tāo o te pono, te tika, me te aroha, tūturu whakamaua kia tīna, tīna, haumie, kuie, tāikie. E te iwi, hei ko nā rā.